Hi, a uh, very good evening. So, this virtual classroom session will focus on the topic eye bar removal partial lens. So, initially, we will try to compare this eye bar removal partial lens with the conventional removal partial lens, and let's try to find out the differences between the two. And later on, we'll go into details of various design concepts in eye bar removal partial lens. And at the end, we'll also discuss various other concepts like RPI and RPA, both given by Crawl, right? So first, we'll start with, so once again, a very good evening. Hi, everyone. And I hope you can start, right? Uh, let me know if I'm not audible or let me know if you want me to raise my voice further. And I hope it is streaming fine. Yeah, hi. Okay, fine then. So we have this concept of eye bar removal partial denture, and the name of the scientist has introduced this design is Kretok Will. So Kretok Will has introduced this design of eye bar removal partial denture. So what is this eye bar? Uh, so what kind of retainer is it? And in what way is it different from the conventional removal partial denture? So first let's uh, compare, as I said, this eye bar removal partial denture with that of a conventional removal partial denture. So first let me write down a conventional on the left side versus eye bar removal partial denture on the right. So coming to a rest placement. So if you remember, we have previously discussed this concept of class presently, rest, rest seat, direct retainer and indirect retainer in one of the previous live sessions, we remember. So in case of conventional removal partial dentures, rests are usually placed adjacent to edentulous area. So let's assume that this is an edentulous area and you have an occlusal aspect, a tooth, a molar, for example. So you'll have a rest seat preparation, you'll place a rest here and then you'll have something called as direct and indirect retainers, right? So the rests are placed immediately adjacent to the edentulous area in case of a conventional removal partial denture, right? Take for example, distal extension partial denture. So in case of eye bar, we prefer a mesial rest over a distal rest. So let's assume we have a distal extension partial denture as represented in this case. So we have a edentulous area and then we have abutment T. And if you observe, the green one represents the rest the blue one represents the proximal plate and red one represents I bar, RPI, rest, proximal plate and I bar. So as you can see here, rest is placed away from the edentulous area. It's not placed here as we see in a conventional design. Instead, a rest is placed on the opposite side away from the edentulous area. So we have, in case of distal extension denture base, a mesial rest over a distal rest. So that's one comparison we can make between a conventional RPD and an eye bar removal partial lens. And then coming to guide planes. So guide planes on which we have this proximal plane design, right? So we have guide planes on the two and this blue represents a proximal plane. So guide planes are usually shorter in length, occlusal gingivality, which is around Two to five mm. So this guide plane on the tooth it extends only two to five mm occlusal gingivally in case of conventional RPD. Whereas in case of eye bar, we have longer guide planes which extend from the marginal ridge and extend onto the tooth gingival surface junction and even cross the junction two mm beyond the junction. So in case of your eye bar removal partial denture, the guide planes are comparatively longer, 
right? So that's another difference we find. And coming to retainer, so it's obvious that we have something called a circumferential class, or class which is encircling the two, and you have this reciprocal arm and retentive arm traveling in opposite directions, encircling the tooth, buckling them. That's in case of your conventional design. For example, C class or any circumferential class, right? But here, we use I bar for direct retention, except for RPA where you use this Eckers class, which we'll discuss later. However, for sake of direct retention, we use I bar. So this is your I bar in case of your I bar removal partial ledger. So these are some of the main differences which we can see when we compare uh, I bar removal partial denture with that of conventional removal partial denture. I hope it's clear. I'll just hold on for two minutes. You have or you need any clarifications, do let me know. So guide pen is nothing but which is prepared on the proximal part of your tooth, right? So guide pen is something which is present on the proximal aspect of your tooth, whereas proximal plate is a process which we designed in order to place it along the guide plane. So guide plane, it is shorter in case of your conventional RPD, where the guide pen extends only from this aspect to this aspect. Now let me just draw it again. So we have this abutment tooth, assume, so in case of conventional RPD, guide plane extends from only this area, that is approximately 2 to 5 mm, occlusal gingivally is the extension of your guide plane. Whereas in case of your eye bar removal partial denture, you can see the guide planes extending from or all along the surface of your tooth. So the guide planes are longer in case of your eye bar removal partial denture, where they extend all along the proximal surface, right from the beginning, from the marginal ridge till your gingival third of your tooth, right? So that's the difference we have in terms of guide plane length. Mesial crest, okay. So again, I'll, I'll just repeat once again. So that's pertaining to this guide plane. And as you can see, we're talking about crest, right? So just assume that we have this context where we're trying to construct a removal partial denture in this case, where you have, I mean, the distal most tooth are absent, so you go for a distal extension denture base in this case. So conventional design says that the rest has to be placed on the area or on the proximal aspect, which is adjacent to the edentulous area. So that's the conventional design. But we are going for a mesial rest rather than distal rest in case of high bar removal partial denture. The reason we'll discuss later, right? Why we're going for a mesial rest rather than a distal rest. We'll discuss all the reasons completely subsequently, right? So that's another difference we have. And coming to direct retainer. So we use a circumferential class or class which encircles the tooth, right? With a retention arm and reciprocal arm in case of a conventional design. But in case of your eye bar removal partial denture. So the direct retention is obtained using your eye bar, which is nothing but a modified bar or it's a modified roach class. Roach class, right? So these are just, I just wanted to give you the differences first and then we'll go into the details, right? Yeah. Hope it's clear, uh, Suri. Right, so now going into the details of the design concept, it's very simple to understand provided we just pay close attention to detail. So first we'll discuss or start with rest. So as we have been discussing rest. So why do we go for a mesial rest when compared to a distal rest? There are three important factors. And by the way, remember, you can observe here a rest, right? So as I said, the green represents rest, mesial rest. So this mesial rest is connected to the major connector via a minor connector, which is not seen here because this is the buccal aspect or labial aspect. But you'll have minor connector present lingual. So that's important. So 
A minor connector is something which connects the components of an RPD with the major connector, right? So this rest is connected to the major connector via a minor connector which is present along mesolingual embrasure. It's present along mesolingual, it's present lingually, so it's not visible from this view, right? So the position of minor connector is important. We'll, dis we'll discuss that again subsequently. So the point here is a rest is placed mesially in case of eye removal partial denture because of the following reasons. The first reason is when you place it mesial, the rest produces mesial tipping of tooth whenever there is load. And also the rest is away from load thereby pushing the fulcrum away from the distal edentulous area which we'll discuss that elaborate and then helps in transferring forces along long axis of tooth so these are the three reasons why we place a easier rest than a distal rest in case of your distal extension denture basis let me just explain these points now so first of all assume that we have placed this rest distal as in case of a conventional design so when you place it distally obviously when there is a load there is a distal tipping so there will be distal tipping so in this direction um, for example or let me just draw here itself so you place a rest distal assume that this is mesial and this is distal when you place a rest distally which shouldn't be done if you place there can be distal tipping as a result of the distal tipping there can be damage to the abutment tooth but once you place the rest mesially there will be mesial tipping and this mesial tipping so there will be mesial tipping when you place a rest mesially and this mesial tipping so mesial tipping is compensated or balanced by the extent tooth which is in contact with this abutment tooth so that's very important i hope it's clear so we go for mesial rest because even though it produces mesial tipping in fact there is no tipping produced because it is being contracted by the extent tooth in contact as a result of which the forces will be traveling along the long axis of abutment which is considered to be favorable as we have seen yesterday isn't it so mesial tipping is prevented or contracted by your adsense sound tooth and also as a result there is transfer of forces along the long axis of tooth and when you're placing this rest towards the mesial side you are shifting the fulcrum away from the edentulous area or away from the load so what is this fulcrum all about for example you have this pivot and i placed a pen here so this pen is rotating along this pivot so this is the fulcrum so the point where there is movement right so similarly in this area there is load acting because you replace that with naturality and artificiality there will be some load so because of this load if you place the rest here more forces will be acting here because the closer the fulcrum and the load the greater the forces that act but once you place the rest away from the eventualist area towards the mesial side so you're shifting the fulcrum fulcrum is a point at which rocking can happen so you're in fact shifting the fulcrum away from the eventualist area thereby protecting the soft tissues from damage due to occlusal forces so we have this concept of fulcrum lever lever and fulcrum we have discussed that yesterday i asked you to refer also we have different principles of lever it's pretty easy to understand so to summarize all this once again so we're trying to shift the fulcrum away from the edentulous area in order to prevent damage to the soft tissues because the farther the fulcrum the lesser the deleterious forces that act on this edentulous soft tissue joint right so this is the reason why we place rest mesially right so that's pertaining to the first concept of design that is rest so we place rest mesially because the mesial tipping can be contracted by the proximal tooth and also it shifts the fulcrum away from the dentulous area thereby protecting the soft tissues from deleterious effects of forces and also helps in transferring forces along the long axis of tooth right and then you have the second concept 
a second design that is proximal plate. So just remember the acronym RPI. So first we have discussed about rest. Now let's discuss about proximal plate. So what should be the orientation of proximal plate and what should be the design of a proximal plate in case of your eye bar removable partial lesion. So let me just uh, write down as PP. PP stands for proximal plate. So as we have discussed previously, in case of your conventional RPD, the length of your proximal plate will be approximately 2 to 5 mm only. So I have even drawn this image. And I also mentioned that the proximal plate extends only from this area to this area in case of a conventional design. But in case of your eye bar removal partial denture, the proximal plate extends from the marginal ridge and even extends onto the two tissue surface and extends 2 mm onto the tissue surface or onto the attached gingiva. So in case of your eye bar removal partial denture, the proximal plate extends from the marginal ridge. Let me just write down here so that you can even note down these points. So, proximal plate extends from the marginal ridge to 2 mm onto attached gingiva. So, it extends from the marginal ridge, covering all the proximal surface of tooth and extending or crossing the tooth gingival surface junction and extending onto gingival surface. By 2 mm, right? So that's the extension of a proximal plate. And remember, we have two proximal plates here. One proximal plate, which you can see here, the other proximal plate, which is present lingually, connecting the rest with the major connector. So I, I mentioned previously that we have something called as rest, and the rest is connected to the major connector by means of a minor connector, which is present in the mesolingual embrasure, which is not seen here. And along that minor connector, you have another proximal plate, right? So we have two proximal plates. We'll discuss the reasons why we have two proximal plates. So one proximal plate in the mesolingual area and the other proximal plate here extending from the marginal ridge and extending on to the attached gingiva for about 2 mm, right? So why do we have these longer proximal plates? In case of your conventional design, we have shorter proximal plates. But why do we have longer proximal plates here? Remember, guide planes, proximal plates, they enhance cross arch stabilization. So because of the longer proximal plates, we have increased or enhanced stability of the denture. And moreover, when you have this long guide plane, even the retention improves because you have only single path of removal of the denture. So, increased stability, increased retention, and also, we'll discuss this point again later, whenever this eye bar gets engaged into the undercut which is present here, so this eye bar is nothing but your primary retention, right? It helps or it provides primary retention. So whenever this eye bar is engaged onto the buccal aspect, then this is reciprocated by the proximal plate is present distally. So this proximal plate also helps in not only increase stability and retention, but also helps in reciprocation. So helps in stability, retention, reciprocation, and also helps in dissipation of occlusal forces and protects tooth tissue junction or the gingival surface because it is covering even the gingival surface. So these are some of the advantages we have with a longer proximal plate or a longer guide plate, right? I hope it's clear, okay? So I just hold on here for two minutes and then before going into eye bar, which is again very, very important, I'll just take up any questions if you have in case. Hi, Sanchita. You can just mail such questions, right? Which is out of context. You can just drop a mail, I'll definitely reply. You have any questions from this particular topic? I'd be glad to answer. Just remember, external line angle is something which projects externally or which faces externally. In, for example, axopalpal line angle, internal line angle, all other line angles which project or face internally. 
drop a mail, I'll just clarify that once again. Yeah, hi. So I hope it's clear. Yeah, reciprocation. It's, uh, anyways, I'll just explain that again, Komal, while going through I bar. So whenever, so this proximal plate, which is present on distal side, helps in reciprocation. So when do you need uh, reciprocation? When you have one force coming, we should have another force acting in opposite direction. So that's called as reciprocation, right? So I bar helps in primary retention. So when you have this uh, retention arm, you should even have a reciprocal arm to counter the forces or to have a support to the processes or a workman thing. So this I bar helps in providing retention, primary retention, and reciprocation is provided by your distally placed proximal plate. Because your I bar, when, it's get, when it gets engaged mesially, whenever there are occlusal forces. So whenever there are any occlusal forces, the I bar gets engaged mesially providing retention and at the same time the tooth is prevented from drifting distally by the action of this proximal plate which is present distally so it helps in reciprocation or countering the primary retention i hope it's clear right anyways we'll just go into detail when we are discussing i bar No matter what the design of the denture is, ultimately our aim is to make sure that the forces are dissipated along the long axis. And by the way, we discussed some of the uh, forces, how they're going to dissipate, right? So our objective here is to allow them to pass through the long axis of tooth. That's the reason why we are having these variations and designs. Right? Yeah. Now, let's move on to I bar. So we have discussed rest proximal plate and now we are going to I bar. So I bar is nothing but a modified bar. It's a modified roach clasp and it's used for retention. So I bar is used for primary retention. So the function of this I bar is to provide retention as it is obvious. So the characters or the features of I bar are very important. If you observe here, the I bar seems to be very long, it seems to be very narrow, and the cross section of I bar is semi circular. So if you observe the cross section, it will be something like this semi circular, not a full circle. And also, this I bar when you are modifying or when you are designing it, it's very important that if you observe the tooth as such, so we have something called as mesodistal contour or height of contour. So the tooth is not flat as you can see here. It, we have this bulge, something like this on the buccal aspect, right? So assume that this is your tooth and this is your bulge. So we have your mesial side and distal side. And here you have something called as height of contour, which I have marked with a pen. So you can see this is a height of contour, right? So the bar has to be placed mesial to the height of contour, engaging the undercut which is present mesial. So you have an undercut here, as you can see in my hand. So the location of bar is very important. I bar has to be placed mesial to the height of contour, mesiodistal. So we have this mesiodistal height of contour. I bar has to be placed mesially, engaging the mesial undercut. So that's the location for your I bar. And also, most importantly, this I bar should extend 2 mm onto the tooth surface from tooth tissue junction. So this is a tooth tissue junction. So this extension has to be, I just don't want to spoil that illustration. So I'm not able to draw on that. Anyways, so this extension has to be 2 mm. Right? I hope it's clear. So I bar. It is long, it is narrow, semicircular in cross section, and it is placed buccally. Right? That's again very important. It's placed buccally and it engages the mesial undercut and has to be placed slightly mesial to the mesodistal height of contour. And it has to engage the mesial undercut and should extend 2 mm onto the tooth surface from the gingival aspect from the tooth tissue junction, it should extend 2 mm onto the tooth structure. 
So these are some of the specifications while designing IBAR. And most importantly, IBAR is very flexible. I hope you can see. It is slightly flexible and it can engage even an undercut of 0.01 inch. So this 0.01 inch translates to around 0.234 mm. 0.234 mm. 0.2 mm. Right? So it means even though you have a very minimal undercut, very minimal, 0.2 mm undercut, even that can be engaged using your eye bar. So that's an advantage in fact. So in areas where you have minimal undercuts, you can use this eye bar, right? And also, as I said, this eye bar is flexible. So it is passive. So when it's flexible, what does it mean? It doesn't actively, assume that this is eye bar, this is tooth. So this, it doesn't actively engage a tooth when it is in function. So it is passive in relation to the abutment tooth and becomes active only when there is some load because it, the tip is flexible. So it can engage the mesial undercut whenever there is some load acting on the artery, right? As a result of which, the abutment tooth has no uh, abnormal forces acting on it because of this eye bar. Because eye bar is flexible, its relation to tooth is very much passive and it doesn't cause deleterious forces uh, acting onto this abutment. So these are some of the advantages we have with eye bar and most importantly, it can be used even to engage an undercut of 0.01 inch, which translates to 0.234 mm exactly. And even most important is the fact that, why do you think they have introduced this concept of RPA or IBA, especially by Kretokil? So we have this name of the scientist Kretokil and Kroll, who later introduced this concept of RPA and RPA. Why do you think they have introduced this concept? It's because the main reason here is to have minimal coverage of tooth by your retainer. Because conventional clasps and all, if you observe, they're much more bulky. You have a rest, you have a primary retentive arm, a reciprocal arm, so it's very much bulky, which covers almost most part of your tooth, making oral hygiene a problem or a challenge and making aesthetics very poor. So to work on that, we have this concept where there is minimal coverage of tooth as well as tissue. So because of this minimal coverage of tooth as well as tissue, there is enhanced aesthetics. And most importantly, there is better oral hygiene, which can be maintained. That's possible because of these designs, right? I hope it's clear. So that's the, the logic behind introducing these concepts, right? And so this completes our eye bar and its advantages. So I hope it's clear. Uh, we still have some design modifications, which we'll discuss in another two minutes. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Exactly. Ibar is a written to arm. It retains the processes. It retains the processes by engaging the mesial undercut on the buccal surface. No, I-bar doesn't press the gum. It doesn't uh, come in contact with the soft tissues. Regina? Yeah, yes, Abhishek. The red one is I-bar, green is rest, blue is proximal plate. Don't worry, anyways, I'll summarize at the end of the session. Yes, Karunjit, I have got to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. So, you'll have a summary at the end of the session. Don't worry. And then we have these MCQs for discussion, right? I'll frame 10 MCQs and we'll have fun at the end of the session. Yeah, simple Nihari. Come see, this is your gingival surface, right? So assume that this is your tooth. So from this point, I hope you can see, from this point, the eye bar extends 2 ml onto the tooth. From the tooth tissue junction, that is from here, the eye bar extends 2 ml onto the tooth. 
Yeah, even I'm excited because when I was in undergraduation, I'm terrified by all these topics. But now it's a totally different story. After post graduation, rank, entrance, and all, my perception has personally changed. I started enjoying a subject rather than getting terrified because you know. We have this vibers and all that's really terrifying, and I never did good in any vibers. I used to stutter and stammer in vibers. I'm a very poor student uh, academically during my graduation. But once I start enjoying, this is what we can do. We can learn the concept. We can even teach the concept, and it's a kind of reciprocation, and the excitement just gets transferred to everyone. Yeah, pretty. I I restricted myself to this picture, right? So we're discussing now. We'll be discussing the RPI, the again place religion here. We'll discuss that next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Out of forty-five days of my professor posting, I mean, whoever couldn't answer why were they used to uh, make uh, their way to stand outside. So I was the only person in the batch who stood for most number of days in my entire posting. Maybe around 25 days or 26 days out of 30 working days, I stood 25 or 24 days. I even counted because uh, I gave a worst performance possible. Right. So we'll just proceed then. So after discussing these RPA concepts, the traditional RPA concepts or rest proximal period or IBA removable denture uh, concept, we still have RPA to discuss later. But we have certain modifications which need to be considered. For example, all the things which we have discussed now can be applied when you don't have any abnormalities with respect to abutment. But what if the abutment teeth are not properly placed, or what if they are tilted? What if they are buccally tilted? What if the tooth is not a sound structural? So under these circumstances. We need to modify the design, which we'll discuss now. So first, I hope you can see if I write here. So the first one, when you have tilted teeth, yeah, I think you can see that, right? So when you have tilted teeth, or when you have extreme tilting. Or when you have a buccal tipping, we're talking about tilting or tipping of your abutment teeth. Or because after all, these concepts are being applied to abutment teeth, isn't it? The design concepts and all. And what if the buccal undercut is absent? What if there is high frenal attachment? What if there is no adequate attach gingiva? So these are some of the variations which we can see. And what can what can we do in order to? Yeah, I hope you can see. There is some reflection. Please don't mind. Anyways, I'll just uh, read that. So in this context, so what kind of design modifications do we incorporate in the existing concept of design? So in case of tilted teeth. We can go for. Let me just use a different color pen. Yeah. What if we have tilted teeth? So, in case of tilting, how do you prepare the rest? How do you in, uh, incorporate and engage your eye bar? So, in case of tilted teeth, and most important, how do you prepare guide planes if the tooth is tilted? So, we can go for enameloplasty. So, enameloplasty. And we can modify the contour of a tooth, and then we can go ahead with guide plane preparation and the rest of the design concepts as, as usual. And then, whenever there is extreme tilting, then what do we do? Even when enameloplasty is done, it wouldn't be adequate to get the proper contour, right? So in that case, we go with cast restorations. We place a cast restoration in a normal contour. And then try to incorporate these design concepts while constructing your denture bases, removable partial dentures. And in case of buccal tipping, what do we do? When you have this, I mean, this is a normal tooth, right? Whenever the tooth is buccally tipped, then you can't place your eye bar because eye bar is placed from the buccal approach. 
from the label approach. But once your buckle to or buckle aspect is tipped, then it is not feasible for you to place the right bar because there will be hindrance or interference. In that case, what we do is we modify the rest area, the mesial rest area, and we extend the rest area. Let me just write down here itself. So we modify the rest area and we extend the rest area facially as well as lingually in such a way that it has a length of 3 mm occlusal gingival length. So this is very important. So the rest area is modified and the rest is placed in such a way that the rest extends not only on the occlusal surface but also on the facial as well as the lingual surface of a tooth. 3 mm occlusal gingival length. That's the height of your rest and rest area. So that there can be enhanced retention because eye bar can be placed in such cases. So extensive preparation of rest in case of your buccal tipping. In case when there is buccal undercut absent. So for example, the concept of eye bar works only when you have this mesial undercut on the buccal aspect, right? So what if the undercut is absent there? So we do enameloplasty and that is called as dimpling. D I M P L I N G. Dimple. Dimple creation. Some a few of you will have dimples when you smile. So dimpling is a process of enhancing your buckle, your undercut area. So when there is absent buckle undercut, we prepare a buckle undercut using a procedure. I mean using your purse and all, or using your cast on your cast, and then you call this procedure as dimpling. D I M P L I N G. And also, whenever there is high phenyl attachment or whenever there is no adequate attached gingiva, do you think you can place your proximal plate normally or do you think you can place your eye bar normally? Eye bar can't be placed in case of a high phenyl attachment, in case of a muzzle attachment because the tissues will interfere with your placement of eye bar because eye bar is approaching gingivally, right? So in such cases, what do we do? We go for phrenectomy. Or we can go for grafting procedure to enhance or increase the width of attached gingiva. Or you have this concept of RPA. RPA concept. So RPA concept is rest proximal plate and anchors clasp or circumferential clasp. So in cases of high frenal attachment, tissue undercuts, inadequate attached gingiva, where I bar can't be placed, instead of I bar as a primary retainer you place a circumferential clasp or acres clasp. So that's called as RPA concept given by RPA, given by Crawl in 1980, right? So these are some of the design variations which you can see. Don't worry, I'll summarize that once again at the end of the session, right? Now, moving on to RPA concept. So this is about the IBAR RPD designs and the design variations. Now moving on to RPI. Already we have discussed RPA. So RPA is nothing but we have a slight modification from the conventional I bar RPD with respect to RPA. The modifications are very simple. So as I said, I bar RPD design was given by Kretopfel. 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 I'm sorry. But RPA and the RPA concepts were given by Kroll. Kroll in 1973 has given the concept of RPI and Kroll in 1980 has given the concept of RPA, right? So what is this RPA concept again? So as we have discussed previously, RPA concept when compared to the conventional IBAR RPD is more conservative. Just remember this one more. So RPA concept, all the designs will be much more conservative. As you can see here, first we'll start with R, that is rest. So as you can see here, can you see the rest area? It is very much conservative. In case of molars, the rest and rest area are confined only to triangular fossas. In case of your canine, if you're planning to place a rest in anterior tooth on canine, it appears to be small circular. So basically, in case of RPI, the size of your rest area, the size of all these is very much minimal. So the size of rest area is minimized so that 
minimal tissue coverage happens so that there will be better aesthetics and enhanced oral hygiene. So Crohn's concept is simple. Minimize the stress and minimize tooth tissue coverage. So this is Crohn's design. You can just make a note of it. Crohn's design states that there has to be minimal stress with minimal tooth tissue coverage. If you observe all of this, can you see? It's more extensive. I mean, the design of fiber is very much elaborate. It's very long and it is covering almost all the gingival aspect. So it's much more bulky, which can again hamper oral hygiene to some extent. So come the drawbacks there. We're trying to have this RPA concept where the rest area is very much minimally covered or involved so that there is minimal coverage of tooth or soft tissue for better oral hygiene and also aesthetics. So rests, they are very much small. In case of molars, they are confined to triangular fossa. In case of anteriors, on canines, for example, they are confined only as a small circular area rather than trying to complete or cover the entire singular. So if you remember, we have discussed that in one of the videos in each classes. Rests, they cover the entire singular in case of your conventional design, but here we have only a small design. And then moving on to proximal plate. So proximal plate is very important. So proximal plate, crawl has given three modifications. It's very simple. The first modification states that proximal plate, in case of your eye bar design, extends from marginal ridge and extends 2 mm onto the gingiva, attached to gingiva, if you remember. But in case of RPA concept, we have three modifications. The first modification states that the proximal plate extends only from the marginal ridge, that is from here, till the junction of middle and gingival thirds of tooth. I hope it's clear. So modification one in case of proximal plate, according to Kroll, is that it extends only from the marginal ridge to the junction of middle and gingival third of a tooth. That's the first modification. Or you can have another design modification wherein the proximal plate extends from the marginal ridge to the tooth tissue junction, something like this. Let me just draw with the red pen itself. So in case of second design, the proximal plate extends all over the proximal surface with relief in the gingival third. So only the gingival third is not covered by proximal plates, but rest of the area is covered as usual. So first design, extension only from the marginal ridge to the middle and gingival junction of your tooth. The second modification states that there has to be relief only in the gingival third of the tooth, right? And the third modification according to Kroll with respect to proximal plate states that, assume that, I don't have space. Yeah, let me just draw here. So assume that this is your tooth and this is your redentulous area. So the third design states that the proximal plate should extend only 1 mm onto the tooth in the gingival third area. So only minimal coverage of tooth, that is only 1 mm of gingival third of your crown has to be covered. So that's the third design modification, right? So proximal plate, three design modifications. We'll discuss, we'll summarize that one second later. And then coming on to eye bar. So what's the difference between eye bar in case of eye bar removal partial denture, the conventional one, and that given with crawl? If you observe here, look at the shape of this eye bar. The area which is in contact with the tooth, look at the shape here and look at the shape here. It is pod shaped. I mean, you have greater surface area, as you can see here. You have greater surface area which is staying in touch with the tooth for enhanced retention. And most importantly, this eye bar is placed more mesially compared to the previous design. So that whenever there is load, the eye bar shifts towards the mesial embrasure. So that whenever there is a load acting, it shifts towards 
the mesial embrasure engages the embrasure area and enhances the retention. Anyways, the reciprocation is provided by this proximal plate which is present on distal side. So these are some of the modifications we have in case of your RPA concept given by Kroll in 1973, right? And then RPA concept we have discussed previously. So this formally completes the topic, eye bar removal partial denture, right? I hope it's clear. Yeah, sure, Bernice. That would be my pleasure. So, the proximal plate modification. So in case of modification one, proximal blade first modification, the proximal blade extends only from the marginal ridge to the junction of middle and gingival pillars of tooth. This is first modification. And second modification, proximal plate extends as usual with a relief in the gingival third area. So you have a relief in this area. And the third design states that only one mm of the gingival third of your tooth has to be covered by the proximal plate. I hope it's visible for you. Right. So you have some reflection over here. Yeah, sorry, will we just summarize it in that process and repeat everything once again. It seems to be streaming fine for me here. What is that pretty buckle undercut excessive? Can you please elaborate? I mean, in the modification I said when the buckle undercut is minimal or absent, we go for this technique. Yeah. Yeah, Rupali, you're welcome. Right. So do you I mean is it is it streaming fine? Do let me know or is it still breaking? Because it seems to be streaming fine for me here. Okay, right. So do you want me to summarize? Because uh, once we do with summary, uh, we have still MCQs to discuss. Okay, I mean intermittently you can have some issues. I mean, if it's breaking, restart your app or you can restart your web page. Yeah, thanks, Bernice. All right, so we'll proceed with the summary then, right? So, the cons, I mean, I also just wanted to discuss one important point here. In case of your normal class assembly, you have a return to arm and reciprocal arm, which are present buccally and lingually respectively, right? 
but in case of your eye bar, so in case of a normal design, you have a retention or reciprocation acting buccolingual direction. But here, if you observe, the retention is towards the mesial side and the reciprocation is towards the distal side. So the retention resistance direction in case of your eye bar removal partial denture are mesiodistal. That's very important. It's mesiodistal in direction here compared to the buccolingual direction in case of a conventional design, which is another difference which we can note down here, right? So because of this mesiodistal retention reciprocation, it's possible to have this kind of design, right? Okay. I'm glad to hear that Abhishek and Nikhanika. Right. So once again, briefly summarize the entire topic in maximum of 5-10 minutes, right? So first of all, eye bar removal partial denture, as you can see here. So we have components, a rest, which is represented by green, proximal plate represented by blue, and then you have this eye bar represented by red. Okay? And then, along with this, first initially we have discussed the differences between a conventional RPD and eye bar removal partial denture. So in case of conventional RPD, rests are placed adjacent to dentulous area, but here we are placing rest away from the dentulous area because of the following reasons, which we'll summarize again. So we have a mesial rest in case of a displacement partial denture in case of eye bar, eye bar design. And the second one is the proximal plate or guide planes, which are shorter in case of a conventional design with an occlusal gingival length of 2 to 5 mm, and they're longer in case of your eye bar design. And then you have this primary retention by a clasp assembly in case of your clasp, in case of your conventional design. Here, primary retention is through eye bar, right? So now let's go into the design concepts of. I bar and then we'll proceed with RPI and RPA. Just give me one minute, right? Right. So now just give me one second. I'm sorry. So coming to this I bar RPD, as we discussed, we have three components. First, starting with the rest. So the rest is placed mesially, represented by green, because it produces mesial tipping that is countered by your mesial tooth, which is in contact, right? So there are vertical forces acting along the long axis, and moreover, tipping of tooth is prevented, right? And also, because you're placing this rest towards the mesial side, we're in fact pushing the fulcrum away from the load. So the tissues are prevented from uh, acting upon by deleterious forces, right? So we're shifting the fulcrum away from the load in case of this design where you're placing your rest away. That is towards the mesial side, but not towards the distal side. So these are the reasons why we place a rest mesially, but not distally in case of your distal extension denture basis. We have taken distal extension denture base as a model to explain this RPA concept. And then we have this proximal plate. So proximal plate usually extends from the marginal ridge and extends on to the attached gingiva, 2 mm onto the attached gingiva. So it covers the entire proximal surface of not only the tooth, but even extends on to the attached gingiva by 2 mm. And proximal plate, the functions are, or the advantages of these longer Guide planes or proximal plates are increased cross arch stability or horizontal stability, increased retention, enhanced reciprocation because you have this proximal plate mesially as well as distally. Distal proximal plate helps in reciprocation. Also, there is uniform distribution of load and protection to the attached gingiva as it is covering it. And also, you have something called as mesial proximal plate which is present along the mesial lingual area. Now, Coming to I bar, so as you can see, I bar is 
mainly used for retention, primary retention. So it's long, narrow, tapering, and it is semicircular in cross section, engages the mesial undercut, and it has to be present 2 mm or it has to extend 2 mm onto the sound tooth. That's very important, right? And most important, it is flexible and can engage an undercut of point not one inch, which is approximately 0.234 mm. And also, I just wanted to discuss another point. Yeah, that's pertaining to I-bar. So after discussing these design concepts, we have certain variations, right? And also remember I-bar, it is flexible. And as I said, it can engage an undercut of 0.01 inch. Now coming to various design variations or which we can have in cases where you have tilted teeth or where you have no undercuts present, or where you have normalities associated with abutment teeth. In such cases, so when you have tilted teeth, you can do amyloplasty and create the undercut. That's what I was about to say previously. So this I-bar basically engages the mesial undercut. It has to be placed slightly mesial to the mesiodistal height of contour. You have something called as mesiodistal height of contour. So the eye bar has to be placed slightly mesial to this height of contour to engage the mesial undercut area. So if in case there is tilting of tooth, it is a challenging for us to prepare guide planes. In such case, we can go for enameloplasty and modify the contour. If the tilting of tooth is severe, then even enameloplasty would be of no use. In such cases, we go for complete coverage or cast restoration with a desired contour. And in cases where you have buccal tipping, so buckle taping, if you have this buckle taping, then it will be difficult for you to place an eye bar from the buckle aspect as there can be interference. In that case, they extensively prepare the rest area, extend it all over the occlusal surface and onto the lingual and facial surface. And the extension has to be 3 mm occlusal gingivally. That's very important. And when a buckle undercut is not present, if the tooth is normal, but still the buckle surface seems to be uh, there is no mesial undercut, buccal mesial undercut is absent. So you can create an undercut and this procedure is called as dimpling. And whenever there is high frenal attachment, go for phrenectomy. Whenever there is high muscular attachment, surgical procedure is indicated. And when there is no adequate attached gingiva, then obviously you will have to go for graft procedures to enhance the gingival well. All this because of the design as such of IBAR. And in cases where there is high frenal attachment, tissue undercuts, you can go for an alternative design that is RPA, Rest Proximal Plate and Acres Class, where you use an Acres Class for circumferential class rather than this eye bar because eye bar can't be used whenever you have this high frenal attachments or high muscle attachments. As you can see, eye bar approaches from the tissue side onto the tooth. So when you have this high frenal attachment, you obviously can't use this eye bar, isn't it? Now, after completing these variations, we have something called as RPA concept given by Kroll. By the way, this conventional IBAR RPD design was introduced by Kretokwil. Kretokwil and RPA concept was introduced by Kroll in 1973. RPA concept by Kroll in 1980. And the Kroll's principle is that there has to be minimal stress with minimal tooth and tissue coverage. So keeping this principle in mind, if you remember this principle, obviously you will get the design in mind because rest is prepared more conservatively only involving the triangular fossa in case of your posterior teeth or a small conservative design in case of your anterior teeth. Proximal plate you can have three modifications, three designs in fact. So the first design extending from the, the I mean the designs of proximal plate, the first one extending from the marginal ridge to the junction of middle third and gingival third of tooth. The second one is you can give and relief in the gingival third of a tooth while designing a proximal plate. And the third one is covering only one mm of your gingival third of your tooth with your proximal plate. And then you have this eye bar. The difference between this eye bar and the previous one is eye bar seems to be pod shaped with more surface area and it's placed more mesially so that under load it engages mesial undercut as well as mesial embrasure area, obviously. Mesial side you'll have retention and distal side you'll have reciprocation, right? So this uh, completes our summary as well, right? You have any questions, we'll just give you five minutes and then we'll proceed with MCQ discussion.
Yeah, in case of buckle clipping, I mean it's mentioned just this way. So in case when the tooth is tipped buckly, then you prepare a rest area occlusally and also extend that rest labially 3 mm and also lingually 3 mm. So that's the modification given in case of buckle tipping. There is extensive preparation of your rest area occlusally, buckly and lingually so that it not only helps in this, uh, I mean it also enhances the retention because eye bar can't be placed in such cases. Yeah, Vaishali, we have three liver principles with illustrations given in Rosenstein. I advise you to go through it because you have these three components, effort, fulcrum, and you have this lever. So we just go through them because, uh, I mean, uh, it's out of context here in this case. Uh, we'll, or we'll try to have another session if possible, right? You just Google three liver principles, you'll get beautiful illustration. You'll see a fisherman trying to catch fish. And there you can see where you have the load, fulcrum and lever acting. And you have another person who is pushing a cart. You will see where the load, fulcrum and lever do act. And you have the seesaw which we play. So again we will have a difference there. So three lever principles given with beautiful illustrations. Just you will get that information. It's pretty easy to understand. I bar in RPI, it's pod shaped and it has to be placed more mesial. Pod shaped to increase the contact with tooth for better retention and placed more mesially so that even involves or engages the mesial embrasure area. Actually, I wanted to do this uh, video on liver principle because it's really fun and interesting and the same can be applied in your RPD designs as well. Anyways, with time, I mean based on the time available, I definitely consider the topic as well. Right. So let's have questions then. Is it fine? Yeah, I, I, I remember seeing those images in Rodin still. Don't worry, you can just Google out, you'll get a lot many uh, pictures. Okay, <laughs> MCQs, right? So I've again prepared a lot many controversial questions, not to confuse you, but uh, with the hope that I can increase your confidence in this process, right? Yeah, so we'll proceed with our first MCQ then. In the meantime, let's have music for two minutes. Yeah, Vaishali, you're welcome.
will have uh, 10 multiple choice questions, plus 4 and minus 1 as usual. At the end of the session, throw your scores onto the screen as well. So you have your first question. I-bar RPD design is given by Kroll, Bivan, Hetokwin, Bauche. Very good. So we have an unanimous answer again, which is a good sign. So Ketokwin. Ketokwin has given this design of I-bar RPD. So option C is the right answer. Now, moving on to the next question. Components of I-bar include all except option A, I-bar retainer, option B, easel rest, option C, proximal plate, with a short guide planes, option D, none. Yes, we have it on Bernice, Komal, Neetu, Prithvi, Abhishek, Sahiti, Srish, Najreen. Good. Yes, Suri. Suri says D. Yes, Anu. Yes, maybe not. Yes, here you go. Ashina, why shall Pretty. Yes. So components of fiber include all except. So proximal plate with short guide planes is the right answer because uh, we have proximal plate with longer guide planes, isn't it? So option C is appropriate answer. So proximal plate with short guide plane. It's not short, it has to be long. So we've seen that here, right? I hope it's clear, Suri and Preeti. So next we have assertion and reason. Here yeah, it's pledge. I'm sorry, I've done this typing error, it's plate. Okay, here you have the third question, assertion. Uh, in distal extension denture bases, the distal occlusal rest is incorporated. Reason, this design allows shift in fulcrum line more anteriorly, thereby protecting soft tissues. So let me know which statement is correct. And also let me know if the reason is justifying assertion.
ओके Right. So, how many of you say that A is, uh, I mean, you mean to say A is false, B is true, really? Good. Assertion states that in distal extension denture basis, distal occlusal rest is incorporated, which is obviously false. In case of a distal extension denture basis, as per your RPI design, right? So, you have these advantages when you have this rest incorporated onto the Mesial side. So distal side, you have various problems as we have discussed here, right? So assertion is false, isn't it? Reason, this design, so which design? The design of placing distal occlusal rest. Because we, we have to go by the reason based on what's given in assertion, right? Assertion states in distal extension denture basis, distal occlusal rest is incorporated. And incorporating this distal occlusal rest allows the shift in fulcrum line more anteriorly, thereby protecting soft tissues. So, what do you think now? <laughs> Niharika, you're smart, right? Okay. Both statements are false. We're talking about the design where you're placing a distal occlusal rest in this context. So obviously, distal occlusal rest is not going to push your fulcrum line anteriorly. It's your mesial occlusal rest, right? Exactly. So both the statements are false. Note down your marks, okay? Yes, Drupal has given right answer, isn't it? <laughs> okay, come on. And me too also? Okay, good. Okay, now let's have another controversial question. Not controversial, but straightforward. So fourth question, I hope it's clear, the third one. The fourth one, proximal plate in conventional design and I-bar are 3D extends. Option A, marginal range to 2 mm on to attach a gingiva and 2 to 5 mm occlusal gingiva only. Option B, 2 to 5 mm occlusal gingiva only and marginal range to 2 mm on to attach a gingiva. Option C, 2 mm over attached gingiva. Option D, none of them. Tespriti, Najrin, Niharika, Sahiti, Komala, Omega, Sheena. Hi, Akshay. Bernice. Do we have a mixed opinion again here? Yes, Rupali. Yeah. 
yes, Sirish, Nitu. Come on, okay, try answering that. We'll just proceed with the next question. Yes. So, as we discussed here, in case of a conventional design, you have the proximal blade extending 2 to 5 mm occlusal interval. In case of your eye bar design, we have proximal blade extending from the marginal ridge to over 2 mm onto the attached interval. So, I think it's option B. Yeah, option B is the right answer. Okay? Good. Well, most of you were. Right. So, Coming to the fifth question. Statement one and two. Statement one states tells that the buccolingual width of proximal plate is determined by the proximal contour of tooth adjacent to edentulous space. Statement two. Proximal plate is thinnest it's not in, I'm sorry, it's is. Proximal plate is thinnest, lingually, and thickest, buccally, to allow proper placement of denture teeth. So which among the following statements are true? Or are both statements true? Or are they false? I haven't discussed this here in the live session. So don't worry, guys, we'll be covering that now. Uh, Abhishek, the fourth question, I've done the options ulta. So the first one is wrong. First, the, read out the question first. The question states, proximal plate in conventional design and I bar is respectively. So first you have to answer conventional design and then you have to answer I bar. So look at the options where you have answered for conventional design first, followed by an answer for I bar. So obviously option B is appropriate. Option A is it's a uh, reverse to that of option B. It's completely false. That's why in options, if you observe, it's given. It's not given respectively. Okay, I should have added that respectively part. I mean, I should have added respectively in each option. Then it would have made more sense. Yeah, so coming to the statement. Good Pritika, yes Koma, very good. I mean it's a difficult question, I do agree. Don't choose the option of not attempting, okay? I want you to answer, let that be wrong, I want you to answer. No, Niharika, don't say not attempted. Uh. Okay, now let me get back to the question once again. Good burners, right. So the first statement states that the buccolingual width of proximal plate. So you have this proximal plate. The buccolingual width has to be in compliance with the contour of a tooth. 
So buccal lingual width of proximal plate is determined by the proximal contour of two adjacent edentulous space, which is 100% true. And come to statement two. Proximal plate is thin lingually and thick buccally to allow proper placement of denture teeth. That's the second statement, right? In fact, proximal plate has to be thin buccally and thick lingually because buccally you have to place your denture teeth. So to allow space or room for your denture teeth, the proximal plate has to be thin buccally and thick lingually. So statement two is false. I haven't discussed that, but anyways, we have this context here, so I'll explain you the same. The first statement is true, second is false. <laughs> Niharika, you say you can't understand this question. We're talking about the dimensions of proximal plate, Niharika. The Buccal lingual width. So you have this proximal plate here, right? We only discussed about occlusal gingival height, but not the buccal lingual width. So the buccal lingual width of this proximal plate depends upon the proximal contour of your tooth. If it's a narrow tooth, you'll have a narrow proximal plate. If it's a bulkier tooth like molar, you'll have a bulkier plate, buccal lingual. That's the statement one. And statement two states that this proximal plate, it even extends buccally and lingually, right? So buccally it has to be thin so that there will be room for placement of your denture teeth and lingually it can be thick because your denture teeth are placed slightly buccal to the ridge, isn't it? Yes, Regina and Miharika, I think I repeated, I mean, you still have any ambiguity, let me know. Okay, is it clear? Do you want me to proceed with the next question? Yes, thanks. This question is going to be interesting. Let's see how many of you will hit the bullseye. I'm still typing, you know. This poor guy takes a lot of time to type the entire question with options, and you smart people give a single letter answer, not even a single word answer, but you people are giving me single letter answer. So I feel really jealous about that. Right, sixth question, all of the following are false with respect to eye bar, except eye bar is short and tapering, it has wrong cross section, it's placed on buccal surface of abutment at height of contour, mesodistally. Option D should extend to mm above the tooth tissue junction. So all of the following are false, except with respect to eye bar. Komal, you have to read the question carefully.
Option A seems to be tempting, right? It's false except. Good. So all of the following are false statements except so you need to find out the right statement or true statement with respect to I bar. So first option, I bar is short and tapering, it's wrong. It is long and tapering. Second statement, it has wrong cross section. No, it has semicircular cross section. Third, placed on buccal surface of abutment at height of contour mesodistally. As you can see, that's the scenario here. D should extend 2 mm above the tooth tissue junction. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We are gone with option D. What about option C? It's clear, right? So it's placed mesial to the height of contour, but not at the height of contour. So option C is also a false statement. Option D, it should extend 2 mm onto the tooth from the tooth tissue junction. So option D is the right option. Okay. Yes, Ben, it's good. It's mesial to the yeah, it's on mesial or mesial, slightly mesial to the height of contour. So option D is the right one. I hope it's clear, right? So A, B, C are false statements. Option D is the right statement. Right. So we'll proceed with the seventh question. Good Abhishek, you're right. Yes, Suri, you have to read the question twice. We all have to read the question twice before attempting. So we have a seventh question on screen. So maxillary and mandibular major connectors, because it's an RPD, obviously you'll have this class specimen and all, and then you'll have a major connector, right? So maxillary and mandibular major connectors in I bar design RPD are placed 5 to 6 mm and 3 to 4 mm respectively away from the gingival margin, 3 to 4 mm and 5 to 6 mm respectively away from the gingival margin. 2 to 4 mm and 4 to 5 mm respectively. Option D, none. I don't say this is out of syllabus, right? So this is relevant to the same topic. Yes, Bernice, Rupali, good. Niharika, Prithvi, Abhishek, Komalashina, Prithika, Mega, right. Pretty. 
Strich. Yes, Regina. Yes, I repeat. Yes, Lee through Anu. Right, so option A is the right answer. So, in case of your major connectors, we use a an anterior posterior palatal strap as a maxillary major connector and a lingual bar as a mandibular major connector. And these should end 5 to 6 mm and 3 to 4 mm respectively from the gingival margin. Right, so this is very important. I hope it's clear. Option A is the right answer. Next question, 8. Dimpling refers to preparing guide planes, preparing undercuts, both, none. So what does dimpling, D-I-M-P-L-I-N-G, dimpling refers to? Right. Then it says T, okay. Okay, right. Since it's a computer-based exam, you always have an option to change your answer, right? So dimpling refers to preparing undercuts. That's what we are discussed here, right? So in cases where you have buckle, uh, lack of buckle undercuts, right? In that case, you can perform this dimpling. Creation of undercut, right? Yeah. So option B is the right answer. Let's move on to the penultimate question now. Ninth question. Yes, Nitu, you're right. Good. Yes, Suri. Ninth question. Which of the following represents the principle of crawls design? RPI and RPA concept. Option A, stress control with minimal tooth and tissue coverage. Option B, stress control with maximum tooth coverage and no gingival coverage. Option C, no stress control with uh, maximum tooth coverage and gingival coverage. Option D, none of them. So that's the concept behind the crawls design, right? So there has to be stress control Along with that, there has to be minimal coverage of tooth as well as tissue. So option A is the right answer. Good. Well done. We have an unanimous answer again. So finally, we'll have a tenth question, a final question for today, which is again matching. So you'll have two columns.
It's okay, Suri. You can just refresh your page again. <laughs> you have this matching question, but I love it because I'm framing the question. You'll have a lot many points to learn from a single question in case of match. Okay. So you have two columns.
Okay, is it streaming now? Okay, you can't see, but you can hear. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it seems to be dark even for me. Okay, uh, just give me one second. Okay, you're <laughs> seeing Helen Keller. Good. Okay, somehow it's not, I mean, uh, there is no video, but I hope you can uh, listen to what I'm saying, right? Am I, am I audible? Okay, fine. So just look at, uh, I mean, if you remember what we discussed on board, in case of tilted abutments, A, we go for enameloplastic, isn't it? So A3, in case of excessive mesotissual tipping, where enameloplastic doesn't serve much purpose, we go for cast restoration. So B4, buccally tipped abutment, C, we go for rest seat modification, extensive modification of rest seat, so C2. And absent buccal undercut, we have this procedure called dimpling, that is B6. And high frenal attachments, RPA. So where you go for Akers class. So E1. So A, T, B4, C2, D6, and E1. Okay, I drop your scores now. Uh, we'll just uh, go through the scores and then we'll come through. So this is again a different experience. It's like listening to a class in a dark room. Okay. Right. So Komal thirty, good. So Nithu, it's thirty nine. Good. Ashina thirty one, Rupali thirty, Abhishek twenty five. Good. E is 1. High frenal attachment, you go for phrenectomy. E1, but not 5, because grafting procedures and all for enhancing the width of attachment is never right. Yeah, in case of, I mean, when you have this minimal attachment in Java, so to increase that, I mean, we can go for this grafting procedure. So E1. Yes, Mega. Suresh, good. Yes, Prithvi. Right. There are still any scores? Drop. Yes, Anu, 27. Good. 